This Veterans History Project interview is taking place in the auditorium of the Niles Public Library in Niles, Illinois. Today is Thursday, October the 6th, uh, in the year 2005, and our guest of honor today is a World War II veteran, uh, Jack Weinberg. Mr. Weinberg served in the United States Army in the European theater. Uh, my name is Neil O'Shea. I'm a librarian here at Niles, and I'm a member of the Veterans History Project team. And uh, we appreciate Mr. Weinberg coming in today uh, to enter his testimony in the uh, national effort to document the contributions of his generation um, in the great fight that was World War II. Um, I'm going to begin now by asking uh, Mr. Weinberg if he can state his full name. Jack Weinberg. Jack Weinberg. Thank you. So, um, do you mind if I call you Jack? Sure. So, call me anything you want. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so, Jack, what were you doing before you joined the service? Okay. As it so, so happened, I was going to high, I just finished high school, but I, I did not receive a diploma, but all things, I flunked one course, it was called stenography, which I did basically so I could be near the girls. <laughs> I felt like it is. So I was missing those credits, and as a consequence, I went and um, from there, uh, well, actually, I was a, a, in addition, I was a year behind in school because of a longer story, which we won't go into. Uh, and uh, so I was drafted, I was constrict, conscripted, although my first thought, I took the uh, Army uh, Air Corps um, written exam, and I passed it which was an absolute shock to me. I didn't think I would do it. And when I went for my physical, uh, I failed for w one basic reason, is that I couldn't line up the two boxes. The depth perception was not what they hoped for. And plus the fact, I, what I didn't know at the time, that there was a tremendous need for cannon fodder. Cannon for bodies. Bodies. For bodies. So was this in Chicago that you were? This was in Chicago. I on Van Buren, on their office in Van Buren. I, I uh, uh, got a notification to serve, and uh, was, was 18, 19 years old, and I took the streetcar gratis. They gave me a ticket to take the nickel streetcar or whatever, and I went there, and I went to Camp Grant, and I spent. Uh, Camp Grant is in Illinois, and from there I went on a troop train to Camp Walters, Texas. Now, may I ask what high school you attended? Marshall and Manley. Oh, Marshall, the commandos. Uh, well, I, I wasn't a sports person. <laughs> I was not in command. I was basically there because of music. I love music. Is that right? Yes. And um, this long train ride down to Texas, yes. was that your first big trip outside Chicago? Or yes. Not? It yes, was. Yes. The only other trip, I think, was on a bus to Milwaukee. So this was your education was at right. the beginning. And your first choice of service was the, the Air Corps. Was the Air Corps. And right. you and you were drafted for that or you in you I know, I at, at, I was uh oh I I don't know. I think in high school you took the Air Corps exam. Oh. And I passed it as a consequence when I went for my physical and then they made the, the then you had to make an instant choice. Army, Navy, Marines, because of that particular little foible. I, I wasn't accepted by the Air Corps, so I had to make a choice of the three, and my choice was the Army. You chose the Army instead right. of the Navy. I didn't, want to, you know, I didn't know how to swim. I was the only person that was ever pulled out of the pool in Marshall High School, or Manly. I don't know which of the other. Yeah. But I, I turned my body during the swimming test without opening, I couldn't open my eyes, and I didn't realize that I was in 12 feet of water, and I stood up. So you're on the you're on the train to to Camp Grant no Camp Walters Camp Walters Texas which is an IRT Infantry Replacement Training Center. So I completed my basic training there. Was that difficult? Yes, extremely. Number one, I wasn't particularly athletic. Never was athletic. Uh, if they bracket a word klutz, I would be at both ends of the of the bracket. 
So but, I was the most unlikely person that would, in fact, I think in basic training, uh, there were two instances where they said to me, I give you about five seconds in combat. But they still wanted you. Well, I said I was cannon fodder. Yeah. This is what you had to do. So. so that's about, is that, what is that, about three months, the basic training? Three months. Three months. Three months. Then through some sort of clerical error, I got shipped to Fort Benning and went to the parachute school. Fort Benning's Georgia? Georgia. Georgia. Okay. Parachute, wow. Oh, well, it was right. That's as so bad as jumping in the pool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway. Uh, there were, I don't know, I, and I, I wasn't supposed to be there. As long as I was there, I was, I did most of the training. I went through, and it was terribly physically, I mean, it was, it was physical torture. This was training that people don't realize how difficult it was. You never walked, you always ran. These things were terrible. Anyways, uh, I don't remember what what the exact specifics were, uh, which part of it I think I found out much later in life. Number one, I was a confirmed coward. I wasn't too happy about the situation. But as subsequent medical records would have uh, determined by other people, is that I had had a heart murmur. Now, I'm, the reason I wasn't good at sports because at eight, they didn't allow me to take gym. So I had a heart murmur. So I don't know if that was the reason, but I was probably prepared to go through with it. So I guess whatever reason, I got on a train. They put me on a train, and they sent me to Camp House, which was a home division. It was 103rd Division home at the time. They had just moved from Camp Claiborne, Louisiana, to Camp House in Texas which geographically is outside a city called Gainesville. Next to that was a little town called Mineral Wells, which had crazy water crystals. And our terminology for it was venereal wells. <laughs> and the next town, little town, was Willerford, Texas. And this was where uh, Mary Martin originated from. Little, and they still had wooden sidewalks. Yeah. Next big towns were uh, Dallas and Fort Worth, and Denton, Texas, which was the ladies' home, uh, women's school, a te uh, school for teachers in Denton. Yeah. So Big D was Dallas, and Little D was Denton, yeah. and they had the most. I was, I was, I, I liked the girls. They didn't like me, but I liked them. Those yeah. beautiful girls. Yeah. But uh, it came with no consequence and uh, finished my, and that's how we started getting different sorts of training to go to whatever theater of action. So you were, um, re you were redirected from parachute school then or not? Yes. To this home division? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Which is by, uh, oh, luck or whatever, uh, my brother had just gotten out of it. He was two and a half years older than I was, uh, I was and he'd done, he had served, uh, taken his training in Camp Claiborne, Louisiana. And I got into the 103rd three weeks after he got out and got into the Air Corps. Oh, he got into the yeah, Air Corps. Right. Oh, yeah, right. So a strange uh, twist of fate. So uh, I didn't see him until after the war was over. Uh, naturally, we both survived and still are surviving today. And I said, well, what else do you want to know? I don't know. Yeah, so you come out of, uh, of course, you're from Chicago, right. great melting pot. There's uh -huh. all kinds of different people in Chicago, particularly right. the, the great institution mm -hmm. of the public high school. Mm -hmm. But I would imagine that being in the Army, you meet even more more interesting types from different parts I of met the country. People, I met people who were very, very difficult to deal with. I had nothing but disgust and disdain for some of them and absolutely undying love for others. And, uh, and it, you, you couldn't predict who that was likely to be? Well, or? Uh, the only guy I will tell you, in, in my experience, uh, at first, I, at first, at many points in my life, I was subject to a lot of anti-Semitism. It was just the uh, demographic type of thing. 
and the fact that I wasn't too uh, agile as a soldier, that uh, held me up for ridicule. But uh, as a consequence, I was heartened by it, and I was very tenacious. I mean, the more they heaped on me, the more I took it, the more I would fight back. And I was, uh, oh, I could remember uh, uh, during at Camp Walter's days, uh, somebody uh, was riding me. A couple of people were really riding me because of the religious circumstance. I remember I was cleaning a machine gun one day, and I, I just, just didn't say a word, just picked up a, a metal part, and I remember the name of the part. Nothing else about the machine gun. But I remember it was called a trunnion block. Trunnion block. Right. I, and I picked that piece of metal up and I threw it and I hit him and I put him in a hospital. So naturally, the guy came up for a summary court martial. But nothing came of it because they realized that they were going no place. Because number one, uh, I had a valid complaint. Number two, they still needed a body. So. Uh, uh, and then uh, did that guy ever rejoin the union or? Oh yeah, I was. I didn't hurt him badly. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't my. I I had uh, no really evil intent. I just yeah. I just just uh, just enough. Just enough, you know. Hey, you know, you're not going to yeah get on my fanny anymore, yeah. and which he never did. Yeah. I mean, one thing uh, you you can be a coward as long as you want, and they'll pick on you and they'll tread on you, but if you're provoked enough. You're going to fight back. Yeah. And that's what I did. So you went in, I think your data form here indicates that you went, you enlisted on the 14th of July. I didn't enlist. I was conscripted. Conscripted on the 14th of July, 19... Nobody in their right mind would enlist. <laughs> no way. July 14th, 1943. Right. So now that we're back in Texas in the home division... Right. Uh, and they had no idea of how they wanted us trained. First... We trained as regular infantry, and my position within the platoon, I was in a heavy weapons platoon, which meant they were, we were in 30 caliber heavy machine guns, 81 millimeter mortars, and a sort of uh, small arms for uh, M1 rifles, uh, 30 caliber carbines, uh, pistols, and we had to qualify in all these weapons as uh, best we can, and then I was like sort of a smart ass. I mean, I don't want to drag a base plate, and I don't want to drag a bipod, and I, you know, because these are heavy. So I, I figured, well, I'm going to be in a, I'm going to be the communications part of this little outfit, which meant I was the wire man. The wire man. Well, that was a wonderful thing. All I had to do was carry a little roll of wire with two sound-powered telephones, and go with. Let's say if we're going on a, uh, in the attack. And he, I'd be with a rifle squad, and I he b would be in the nucleus. It would be me, the BAR man. That's a automatic Browning automatic rifle. That's where your fire pump. Okay, we'd have the point man, the scouts on either side, and the rear echelon man, and whoever happens to be in that particular makeup. You had the 60 millimeter mortar and the 30 caliber light machine guns. It was a mix. And the thing that uh, I wish they would have done today, and still do, in, in, in many areas, is that we were all trained in the infantry that whatever the situation was, we, let's say if I was first machine gunner that day, and if my, I was killed, the one that was second machine gunner automatically took the place, or the third machine gunner, or the ammo bearer. We were all like machine parts. We were irreplaceable. We can go from one job to the other job, and there was no question about it. This is what we had to do. This is what our task was. See, yeah. So one person and goes yeah, down. And today you have today where they only do this, and if you tell them, well, you got to turn the right faucet on, they say, well, I don't know about the right faucets. I only work on left faucets. Yeah, specialization to the point right. where it impairs the unit's right. efficiency. Right. Right. And yeah. then within within mm -hmm. we then we train and at the 103rd, I, I, for a while I don't think they really know what they, they we just had to, we we're like in a reserve. They didn't they had to have some people here, and they and I guess we were waiting our turn for whatever problems or the higher-ups decided on. So meanwhile, we started training. Then we started training for, to be amphibious troops, 
So we went into landing craft, and again, I drew the short end of the straw, because when the front opened up, okay, landing. I was the guy on the right or the left that had to run and lay down on the barbed wire. How do you practice for that? You know. <laughs> It's called, you're going to die. <laughs> okay, but this is what we trained for. I mean, the idea was, you think if you lay down on that barbed wire, you... No, no, don't you understand that when, when the front of the boat opened, you were in shallow water. Right. Now, the enemy would be dug in, and it would have coils of barbed wire at right. the shoreline. Yes. So I would have to be with somebody on the, either right or left, it was in, it, it interchangeable, would it be to run the 50 feet or the 25 feet, and when I lay down on the wire, everybody that through the center could pass through, I would hold it down. Hold it down. Yeah. That's called odd jobs. Odd jobs. So you wear gloves or something? or uh... We had wire cutters. We had basically our body. Because we, when you, if you would lie down on it, we had the... Uh, uh, combat uh, fatigues and all that, jackets or whatever, and the at that time the barbed wire really were, it was like, how can I put the equation, it was like somebody you see on TV where they lay on a bed of nails, and once you lay down on that, okay, you can survive, plus being, uh, like in training, being run over, digging a foxhole and being run over by a tank, and fording a river by a uh, bridge or else a rope and all that stuff. So at the end of these various um, types of training yeah. in Texas, you could operate a, a, the phone. Mm -hmm. The phone, you could operate a machine, a, a machine gun, automatic any, rifle, uh, right, a, a machine a gun, pistol, a, a pistol, mortar, mortar, uh, BAR, there were any weapon that was available, we knew how to operate. We could function it. So did you ever feel like, okay, it's time to go. we got to get over there. No. We're all set. We're no. trained now. No. <laughs> no. No. So did you no. get any leave to come home at any time in A here? couple of times I came home and uh, for a short period of time. and then Anybody at home say it's looking good over there, it's looking bad over there, or we're worried about you? Or? My parents and the rest of the family were concerned, but I didn't want them to be concerned because yeah. they were older. I was a the youngest of four of my family, and uh, I would never tell them what I did. And my dad would say, what do you do? And he was, you know, they were from the old country. They really didn't understand that well. Uh, they were totally uneducated. And we had some personal tragedies in the family that further, further advanced it, yeah. where my mother basically was a recluse because uh, I guess my sister had died when she was six yeah. of poisoning. Okay, and she ate an apple or whatever it was, and uh, uh, they didn't recognize how serious it was. And I, I don't really don't know the details because yeah. they never discussed it. Yeah. And uh, so, as a consequence, I do. They had a, a lot of things to deal with, besides uh, being lay, raised during the depression, where food was hard to come by and employment was even harder, and uh, it was difficult. And you had uh, two, three families living together. Did you send money home, like some of the. Uh, there was no money to send. No money to send home. Uh, I was sorry, it was fifty dollars a month, and you'd go to the PX and. Uh, well, I didn't smoke at the time, so, but you'd go to the movies, and I would send. I would try to save and send some money home. Yeah. So when does the te when does your um, the hundred and third. That's your, is that your unit at right. this point? When do they decide? When you say, I, I, I'm sorry to be so dense. When you say home unit, home division, what is that? That's the entire division, 103rd division. It's a called division, home? Home division, right. You have in a division, you have, uh, you have uh, three regiments. It's not finite, but in our regiment, we had three regiments. The 409th, 410th, and 411th. Okay. And, and uh, well, let's see. How can I put it? And with them in those units, or adjunct to those units, you had like your supply part, your artillery parts, your supporting units. But as far we had, uh, each battalion, each regiment was made out of um, uh, of battalions, and the battalion strength 
uh, there were there were four companies, and let's say A, B, and C were rifle companies. D was heavy weapons. Then you had the succession of the alphabet. It would go again, and they were heavy weapons. So you had uh, you had that type of structure, and uh, the, uh, you had uh, I guess three battalions to a to a regiment. I don't remember. So does whole division mean that's the part of the army that's the, back in the states? That, this is like the 103rd Division. That was my home division. Home. Like the 42nd Infantry Division. Yeah. Like the, uh, uh, the uh, whatever. It was, it was usually uh, uh, about 15,000 men. And that was my home division. Like your division teacher at, at school. This is your home division. This is where, you, where your, your unit was ascribed to you with a, with a specific rank, if any, and what your uh, duties were work to perform. So then um, the 130 gets the, the orders to go to the To go, to go. Uh, we didn't know where we were going and uh, we were, uh, went to New York and uh, all of a sudden it was bam boom, we're going on a boat. And we- Sail out of New York? Out of New York. We had, I think I had one, one night at uh, New York, maybe not, I don't remember. And we left from Camp Shanks. And we got on the eight General Brooks, which was a Liberty ship. And uh, we went to, oh, I don't know. I remember I was standing with, with Lynch and... and uh, By this I time, saw, you and Mr. Lynch are friends. Oh, yeah. We're, yeah. Uh, he's, and, uh, well, I'll, part of his history, he was a part of the ASTP, Army Specialized Training Program which was supposed to have been the cream of the crop. He was going to specialized colleges. Well, they dragged him out, and <laughs> he was in the infantry, too, along with a lot of other nice, wonderful people who didn't make it. Yeah. Okay? So I say it was a call for, for blood. Yeah. So you land at La Havre? Or no, 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 no. We went across the Atlantic, and we followed. This was really strange. While we were in this big convoy, we could see the coast of Spain, which was all lit up, and we were all blacked out. But we went through the Mediterranean, through the rocket straight to Gibraltar. I remember seeing the monkeys as we passed by, <laughs> and seeing the British are and, still there, yeah. and seeing Africa. You could see yeah. Africa, yeah. Okay, and see southern Spain, and I hadn't been seasick at all till we got to Marseille. We got to Marseille, and we were at a staging area. And while we were waiting for further orders, uh, we worked on unloading ships with ammo and, you know, artillery shells and all that stuff. And, uh, and then we lived in a pup tent city, and I think we saw one movie, which was Gaslight, with Charles Boyer. Boyer, yeah. Did he drive his wife nuts or okay. something? Yeah. Okay. That was the movie that we saw of record. Yeah, we saw that on the side of the hill, and I guess, I don't know, we spent a couple of weeks there. I don't know exactly when, and then all of a sudden, we had to go to the line. And we got on these big, in these big two-and-a-half-ton trucks, and it was standing on top of our duffel bags. And I can remember the route because I can remember the names. We went from Marseille to Lyon in France. We spent the night outside. I mean, you know, sleeping, you got out of your truck in here. And uh, from uh, Lyon, we, I remember going into, or past Dijon, from which Dijon mustard is the point of origin. And I subsequently read that it was probably the best restaurant in the world was located in Dijon. And uh, one of the nearest big cities was Nancy, Nancy, and uh, that I think is where Eisenhower was headquartered for a time being. And from there we went to Epinal. Oh, that's a, that's a, a city I knew of. I, I didn't know what we did or if I was in there or out of there. And then we were going to relieve the fourth division, I think at a city called San Diego. 
which in our mind it was saying die. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that was the first where we got relieved, and that was our in baptism of fire, and that was on I think November the 11th, as it were, Armistice Day, when we were committed. And I can still remember we were. That's about four months after you huh? uh, enlisted. No, no, that was a year and four. Oh, months. A year and four months. Okay. Uh, and we got there, and uh, I remember we even getting in this bay in the cellar. Scared shipless. Because, you know, on the way up, you know, it's, it's a question of succession. You go past the supply organizations, the medical organizations, and you keep on going forward. Then you see the big 155 guns. Then you see the smaller guns. You uh, can sense you're getting closer to uh -huh. them. Then all of a sudden, it's Molly McGee and me. I figured that's a terrible analogy, but all of a sudden we we had a debark from our trucks and our uh, vehicles, and then it was quiet, and uh, we got to this, to the front, wherever it was, and I could see the uh, patch of this person that was relieving me in the cellar. And I could see the patch was the 4th Division, because I asked him, I said, what is this? That's the 4th Division. I knew they had some horrendously bad times. Even in, uh, I guess, in modern times, they had some that division, although I don't think anybody alive is there still living there that, that experienced it. And I remember being absolutely panicked and, and I looked into a slit in a, in, in a center, cellar window and watching the tracer bullets and the machine gun, you know, Bullets, and you can see them because they were they were uh, they were opting for range. And uh, oh, I don't know, I don't know what happened. Uh, next day, I guess we uh, had to get out of there, and then we were going to the attack, which meant a lot of things. Number one. Uh, you had a, you, you didn't know what what you were doing literally. Uh, I went. I remember I, was, I went with my captain, Captain Lincoln, and I was with my little spool wire and my little phones. And I don't have a good sense of direction. I dropped my phone when we were pinned down, and I had to get back to wherever. The mortars or the machine guns were, I don't know which one I was, probably for both. And uh, when you're serpentining and you're running, you lose sense of direction very rapidly. When you see serpentine, you mean zigzag? Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Because you did that as a matter of training. You, you know, there's a lot of things going on. And I can remember when we, had, we got caught into a barrage and... Uh, what did it happen then? It's, it's sad, but uh, I, w I, I, I was alive after this thing, and I didn't see anybody else who suffered any harm, and then there was one guy who was killed. I'm trying to think of his name, and I, know, I just can't come up with this now. And Kuzmerich. And I walked over and, you know, looked at him. And I didn't see any wound box, so I assumed that uh, concussion got him. I subsequently found out 50 years later that it wasn't the case because somebody else in the outfit had inspected him afterwards and really got into his clothes. And he was hit by a sniper. So, in effect, going going back, not only were the Germans shooting at us in front, but some of our French compadres were shooting us from the rear. Mm. Okay, I mean it's hard to believe, but these are things. These things happen. So anyway, that was uh, part of that 
Say, you know, trying to m move across a field or down a road? Yeah, whatever the object was. I, no, I, I have no idea. I don't know where the hell. Was. I don't think in 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 at. Oh, I'll say maybe at the company hierarchy level, they knew where we were going. I didn't know where I was going. I was told, well, we're going to go over here. Uh, you're going to be on the forward OP tonight or this afternoon, or you're going to do this. And you did what they told you to do. And you just hoped that you, uh, you made it through the day. Or sometimes you made it through the minute. Uh, and it wasn't that, you know, there were sequences of where there was absolutely nothing doing on the front line. Nothing. I mean, you just sat in the hole and you did nothing. You couldn't get out, but you didn't do anything. Business was bad. This is where, when we got into combat, combat, I acquired a very bad habit. Uh, you know, it, once you reach a combat zone, everything is free. I mean that in a very, very funny sense. All your vitals are taken care of, allegedly, your food, clothing, your substance, your cigarettes, anything they can get to you. As a consequence, one of the things, one of the byproducts of being in combat is that I had nothing to do. And I remember having two packs of cigarettes in my pocket, free, and digging a hole in the side. And I took out my uh, cigarette, and out of sheer boredom, that's how I started to smoke. It was probably about 11, uh, November the 15th or whatever the date was. The only food that we had for a while, I think it was for 30 days or close to it, was you only had the lunch ration of uh, the K rations, and that was American cheese with bacon or American cheese without bacon. We had soluble coffee, which is terrible lemonade that would actually take the varnish off the stock of the rifle, and maltose dextrose tablets that if you threw them at the kids that were starving, they would throw them back at you. So that gave, gave me my first little uh, sense of, of doing good for myself and for my buddies that I, to, to that I had, and that because I could speak Yiddish, I learn how to speak German. So I became the focal point of the go-to guy. I was the provider of food. I was provider of certain strategic things that we had to do to survive. Namely, scrounging for food. It's like my buddy Lynch. He was very devoutly Catholic. And I used to go to him, I'm going to go on a raiding party. We're going to get some food. I'm tired of this shit. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. And I would bring back the food, and he would eat it. So one day I said to him, I said, why don't you want to come with me? Because, you know, you eat too. He says, well, he says, you know, I'm very religious. I do not steal. I says, you son of a bitch, you know how to eat. <laughs> It's just it's, it's crazy things that, uh, yeah. and anyways, uh, so we, this is how we, we went, and we acquired certain habits uh, in order to sustain ourselves physically and mentally. Uh, we learned how to, how to hear. In other words, things, sounds that weren't really valid to other people became very life-threatening to us. People don't realize that when you get out into the wilderness and you're in a combat situation of which we were in few, but some things that were very scary was the fact that at one time it was so dark at night, the skies were overcast and there was no moon, no stars, zero. And we were all in foxholes and if you heard a noise, you threw a grenade. The bad feature of that was that it usually wasn't the enemy. So you learned very quickly not to throw grenades for good or for bad. There were times that grenades weren't thrown that should have been thrown. But uh, it was extremely horror-ridden. Somebody else had a brilliant idea. 
because we were losing our own men for no reason at all. We were killing each other. As they made a bank of searchlights, these big aircraft searchlights, and they, I remember they had, I don't know, 10 or, I don't know how many, but they, they shined them at an angle up in the sky. Well, it was just enough to illuminate us so we could make out a person's form. So I don't know how many, how many lives that saved, but what, that was a wonderful idea. And we, we, that, that was one of the sequence of events. And uh, in going on the attack, which was probably the scariest of all things, that means you had to get out of the hole and, you know. Run forward. Go forward. It wasn't running most of the time. You would run when you had to run, but you, you were basically looking for, uh, number one, I would say not looking for a target. We were looking for not to be a target. So uh, obviously I was quite successful. So there's not a, there's not like a fixed line that's readily discernible to a... And not to, not, a, not to not be on the level. ground, yeah. no. You just, here, it, it, there were times, like I say, we were interchangeable, or sometimes we would volunteer. My buddy Lynch, at that time, he was just gotten married. He had a little girl. I was single. And one of the things that nobody wanted to do, especially at night, was be part of what we call the forward OP forward observation post. You do that card, you had to go ahead of everybody. And let's say, where they're coming at us, you have had to be the person to fire the first shot and be the alarm and to be the catalyst for anything that was subsequently to happen. So I would take that because I felt if I got killed, I didn't have a family. And that was it. Uh, so that was one of our bonds, although he never knew it. Does he know it now? I told him once. I don't yeah. So are you still in this, um, this San D or San Diego? We took the San Diego, which had, I found out two months ago, it had great s historical significance for the world. I watched, uh, on the History Challenge, I watched a program on cartography. And at San Diego, they have a, um, uh, oh, I don't know, a religious was a, a Convent, not a convent, but the other one. Monastery? No, a monastery. And this monastery at San Diego, this is a, they had a magnificent uh, staff of card, card, uh, map maker, makers. And this is the first time in the history of the world that the name America appeared on that map as a place of origin or departure or whatever. And I was very impressed by that. I never saw the, uh, the monastery, yeah. but I was well, at least at least we fought for it. And I remember we took a house, and uh, I, I there was no room for souvenirs. I did have a label from a, a, a tailor, and it was I guess I could read it in French, Tellier Saint Dier, and that I kept in my pocket. I don't know. I, I ne never knew what happened to it. That and the fact that we tried to. Uh, we were in somebody's kitchen, and they had one of these grinders that you made, you know, the coffee grinders, and they had some stuff in there. We thought it was coffee. It was that sort of shit that the Germans used to have. That's all they had, okay? And that tasted terrible. I was absolutely, I mean, you rather drink nothing. Yeah. So, and then, uh, like, uh, the other food that we survived now, like the sea rations, which were terrible. The food was so bad. And... Uh, we made, I remember making coffee in our helmets. We would boil the coffee grounds. And I still, I remember the sequence, and after it boiled, you had to get the grounds out. And if you put some salt in there, for some reason, the grounds would go to the bottom. Now, you got to remember, you cooked in there, you bathed in there, and you did uh, uh, just about everything. And if you'd, uh, as stupid as, not as stupid, one of the functions of, of uh, when you're in a foxhole and you can't get out, you have to defecate in a yeah. shovel, okay? And you have, and we used to save our K-ration boxes, number one, because they were very easy to burn. They were made for that purpose. And they were waterproof when they were, now were water resistant. And uh, we would urinate in them and spill it out. 
you stay save the carton. Yeah. And to defecate, it was very, very difficult to do it on a shovel. Well, what we found, we started taking prisoners, we started taking the German shovels. They had a great shovel. We threw ours away. Because their shovel, which it had a fluted locking nut, that when you turned it, it would turn at a 90 degree angle. So number one, the shovel became a pick. And number two, if you had to take a crap, you would put the shovel behind you. Yeah. And you crapped on the shovel, and then you threw it out. Yeah. So that was a very useful tool. Did you use? Did you speak in any German to the German prisoners? Yes, I said that was one of my one of my jobs. We yeah. we got into a situation where you knew they were about to take fr prisoners, so it was up to me to creep up there and say, f to flush them out. I can I could still do the German thing. Kommen Sie raus schnell, Hande ho. Meaning? Come out right now with your hands up. And did they all they did that? Oh, I'm here. <laughs> okay. Were they kind of were they kind of reeling? Were they kind of moving back at this time, or they were still? There were, you know, something you cannot say this is being this or this being that. It depends on any specific instance of time. You played everything depended, like the army said, and I didn't agree with them most of the time. Everything depended on the terrain, the situation, and the terrain what situation you were in, and what terrain you were in. You know, certain things that you had to do, certain things that you didn't do. Certain things that you, cert, well, first time I got one of the, it was, it, we even thought it was funny at the time, although it was pathetic. We, we were dug in in a vineyard in Alsace, and I guess he was tired, he was more tired than I was, and we were digging in together, and he dug his hole not as deep as I did. But just before we were ready to try to get some semblance of rest, got him, rest was a very precious commodity. And uh, I guess we were, there was a, a house not too far away that somebody in another company had to secure that house. And I know what happened because I can still hear the scream. Somebody had bayoneted this German soldier. So, you know, I, I, cause I, I can still hear the scream. We went, tried to get some rest, and there was nothing doing. There wasn't a shot fired the rest of the evening. And then, uh, you know, it started to get damp because of the dew, and I nudged him, and, and he said, Jake, and I said, you know, with Jewish, you, you become Jake automatically, okay? So he says, Jake, I gotta go. So I says, okay, don't do it in the hole. He says, yeah, I'm not gonna do it in the hole. I said, I'll go out, they got the, the, you know, the shrubs over there, the uh, wine shrubs, or whatever you call them. And he went out, I don't think he was gone. And all of a sudden they had this German mortar. I can still, I think it was called a Nubelwerfer. It was a six barrel mortar that was it fires simultaneously with other artillery pieces. And all hell broke loose. I really, 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 really catching hell. Finally, we got the word to get the hell out of there. Okay? And I'm screaming, Lynch, Lynch. I don't see him. I don't hear him. Nothing. So, stuck around. Gotta go. You know, you gotta go. Started to go down the side of that slope of that hill. All of a sudden, I hear the magic word, Jake. I turned around, and I guess it must have been 100 feet away, 150 feet away from the up the hill. He was <laughs> coming down the hill, with, holding on to his trousers, and with the rifle, and with his shelter. When he, the, when he let go of one, the other one would fall down. Well, he had crap all over him, okay? And he had begun, he was alive. He was well. So we... we <clears throat> but we weren't we weren't hysterically laughing. We were laughing because it was funny. I says I says, holy mackerel, I says, you know what kind of picture this is? <laughs> he says, Yeah, I know, it's kind of weird, isn't it? I said, Yeah, let's go. So uh, that was one of the other episodes. And then some of the other uh oh I don't know, it's very unpleasant things. Uh one time I I guess we were in some forest, I think near Strasbourg. 
uh, near Haganau. Uh, I try to place them on the map, but like I say, I never really knew in most instances where I was at. And uh, there was a big tank fight. We, uh, we lost. I saw a German tanks sitting there, bang, 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 five tanks in a row, five shots. Uh, that's all with that situation. I don't know what the hell happened after that. I don't. I remember going on trucks uh, in early December or middle December, and we thought we were going for a rest because we'd gone up first. We'd gone over, I think, to 106, and they were being decimated. And they they just gotten into combat. They were getting slaughtered. They knew nothing. And I don't know what our situation was, but we were there for a couple of days, and we, I guess we were, we determined which way the enemy was. Hard to say, we determined which way the enemy was. And then all of a sudden we had an order to go get on trucks. And uh, it was cold, really cold. And we had our heads covered, and, and we literally used our bodies for warmth. And in combat, we had learned through our um, sorrow that one of the things you depended on and you wanted, if it ever came to it, is you wanted morphine. So when the GI would, one of our buddies would get killed, we would, and we'd take the morphine. Only one problem with morphine, you have to keep it warm. So we'd keep a vial of morphine under each armpit. Thankfully, it never got to that point. I did get wounded one time. I never went back to the battalion aid station. Number one, I wasn't hurt. I mean, I, this is it. The piece of shrapnel. In your... Uh, In my ear. This is a crazy here. place to get Yeah. Hurt, okay? Yeah. You ordinarily don't get wounded. Jack, you were saying somebody should administer this morphine. Uh, you, we had it available. If you knew you were going to, uh, uh, if, if the pain were very severe and you were wounded, you had a, the vial of morphine that you could administer yourself. So uh, we, out of uh, observation, we knew that uh, uh, one vial, of, if you got hurt that bad, wasn't going to be enough. So we learned little tricks of carrying extra morphine. I also learned little tricks like uh, if you happen to be on a 30 caliber water cooled machine gun and it needed water to operate to keep cool. In certain circumstances, we would find a vessel and piss in it and then put mm -hmm. it in the machine gun. If my German trench shovel would freeze, I would piss it into a lot for locking nuts. You learn how to dig a hole, how to survive in it. You learn that the first thing you did is you took some branches, you took the, put something underneath you, because you would get colder underneath you than you would on top of you, because of the dampness. Uh, I remember uh, we had this terrible winter, and we were, Lynch and I were dug into a foxhole, and we were facing out of town, and I guess. The one night, I guess they got mailed to us, and I had a letter from my brother in Italy. And it just so happened, uh, for a day or two, we were bailing water out of our hot foxhole thing. We we put, you know, wood on top of it and all that stuff. And to, to, for us to survive, we had to get rid of water because snow was melting. So we had the ammunition boxes, and we were emptying the water out of the ammunition boxes into the, uh, you know, when we got a chance, we duck it out. I get the letter from my brother, and we were hysterical. And a letter went something like this. Uh, Jack, uh, we just arrived at uh, Sfogia Airfield. I'm part of a uh, bombardier squad or whatever it was. He was a rear machine gunner, as it turned out. And uh, things are terrible. The food is really terrible. And, well, things are looking up. We're intense, but next week we may have electricity. <laughs> so 
this man says to me, boy, he's really got it tough, right? <laughs> and I think we've always, we've always remember that because we were really, I mean, squalor is not the word for it. Mm. And uh, we had a lot of crazy experiences, things that other people did were even crazier. Not crazier. You got to you got to define craziness as uh, as the animal instinct for survival and bizarre behavior. I can remember one time I had a cold and uh, I was hurting, and one of my buddies in the company says, "Jake." I'm going to make you warm right away. And we, we were in this little farming community. I have no idea where they were at. And he said, I'll make you warm right away. He went to three houses on one side and two houses on the other. And he set them on fire. He said, it was warm. And so were we. One time, these are all experiences. They have no date. They have no location. And because I could speak German, I was the procurer. And we were hurting for food. So one of the situations we did when we were in the attack is I devised a situation. I was a PFC, private first class, by act of Congress, because you could not die as a private. You had to die as a private first class. So um, anyway, uh, we'd get in these little towns and we'd take them. And I got a little expertise. If you're near the town, about three o'clock in the afternoon, and it was quiet. I mean, there was bit, no big attack coming in, no big skirmish. So I said, you know, we're going to lay in the weeds. I see smoke coming out of the chimney, and we lay there, and then we wait till about near dusk. Why? We were going to take the town. That was certain. But the reason for taking it around. Late afternoon is the fact we, I saw the smoke and I knew they were cooking. So when's the best time to get somebody out? When he had something to eat coming in. So we get the ass out and we had food. So, uh, which I'm very proud of. Okay, really am. And uh, then there was one time we really were hurting for food. And we get to the small town, and I could, I could read a little German, and this was Beckery, Baker. So, you know, you become an animal. I was an animal. I, I confess, I was, a, I was an animal just like everybody, almost everybody else was an animal. And I walked into this bakery, and I said, in German, it's Mr. Brot. I want bread. And he said, it's not kind of Brot. I have no bread. I said, it's burst abroad. It's now. Now. And uh, the night didn't have any bread. So at that time, during whatever, they had ration coupons and, and coupon books for bread. I could see them all laying in stacks, you know, all the ration cards or whatever. I took all the ration cards, all the paper I could find, I took them and I put them in the middle of the store. And I says, bread, broad, broad, schnell. Vielleicht brauchen Sie ein fire. Would you like a fire? And no, no, no. So I said, okay. And I started to lay down the fire. We got bread. We had black bread, we had rye bread, we had all the bread we could handle. So, uh, which I say I'm very proud to, to yeah. be a part of, because uh, I will tell you, I was one of the few Jewish kids in the infantry. And there were more than you think there were, but uh, the names are very deceiving. But I got to tell you, my respect goes out to one brand of person who for a long time I felt I didn't like, but I got to respect. If you're ever going to go into a combat situation, you want to be with hillbillies. <laughs> now think about it. 
They're very, very used they to could it. live, they learn how to live in the wilderness. They taught me how to live like an animal. They taught me how to shoot and not miss. And they were wonderful huntsmen and wonderful marksmen. And if you're going to be with somebody that you wanted, you wanted them. Unequivocally. You, I couldn't understand them, but I learned to love them. I remember one time I was coming back, I, I, I guess, and uh, I relieved somebody, and they wanted their camouflage pants, which were green. And they had this sound power phone, and he said, Jake, I want my green paints. <laughs> and I what the hell are green paints? What the green paints? You know what it turned out to be? Uh, green pants. Yeah. So, I mean, they, I, you had to learn how to speak their language. Yeah. But they were, and if you really analyze military history, and you go from Sergeant York. That, that, that comes to mind. Uh-huh. Yeah. And you go from Audie Murphy and some others. And I'm not a war buff. I don't, I don't, uh, yeah. certain, uh, I stay away. But, the, the, you know, just by observation, just by just being around, you learn these things. Or you just travel, you go through Kentucky and you see the uh, Alvin York uh, State Park or whatever it is, Memorial Park, and you know what it's all about because you've seen the movie. And uh, they, were the, they were the people to be with. I mean, be with you or you with them or whatever. We complement each other. And you knew you were going to eat too because they, were, they would, if we had, we had one time where we had a little episode where we had... Uh, not much to eat. Went out and forth, got a couple of deer. We knew we'd be there for a couple of days. They hung them up. They drank. They bled them or whatever it is. I don't yeah. know. They bled them. They, 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 and we had venison steaks. And then I, I, I remember the day, uh, it was that day, it was close to the end of the war. And Vince, I, I, I said, Tick, I'll make you some, you know, steak. And he says, I'm not hungry. And meanwhile, before then, he was getting kind of weak, and we were dragging, I was dragging his rifle, and, the, and Cook was dragging his, his ammo, and we were helping, you know, we, he was sick. And uh, we, I kept up for three or four days, and we were getting beat up terribly, physically. And there wasn't too much going out and shooting, but we were getting, we were in the mountains, and it was terrible. The way it was, it, it wasn't a good place to be. And finally we got to this town that was near Heidelberg for some reason. That I remember. Cause, and I, I was looked at him, I said, Dick, you better eat something. He says, I'm not hungry. And I looked at his eyes, his eyes were yellow. So I says, you got to go and get out of here. He says, I don't want to leave. I said, no, you got to get out of here. He says, well, I don't want to leave my buddies. I said, hey, you've got to leave. You've got to go because you're getting to be a burden to me. I don't want you to die because I don't want to die. So you've got to go. He said, I don't have any money. I said, I got 40 bucks. Gave him 40 bucks. Never give them to the Red Cross at all. Because from my experience and others, we never had got anything from them. They only took. They never gave. Okay. Uh, certain things happened that that made me furious, and others. I mean, they were per very personal, very, very, and it depended on the individual. I'm not being fair, but life isn't fair. You go. About, you base a lot of your prejudice on on personal experiences, and one was I had just, you had just received the combat infantry badge. Now, if you'll notice, and I can't help but not notice, anytime you see anybody, that decoration is always on top. And uh, we got that, and uh, we were decimated, and we, were, we had to go back, and we were we hadn't eaten in days. I don't want to tell you the last time we bathed. And physically and emotionally, we were wiped out. And we 
we're staying in with an artillery unit. And they came up with two and a half ton trucks of coffee and donuts. And we were grubby, dirty, smelly, and filthy. And I came out with my cup, and I said, Roberts was with us. I think he died or not. And walked up to the cup, and there were two American Red Cross girls. And we just gotten the combat infantry thing. They were the only, the only clean thing we had. And it was no big deal, but you had to stick it someplace. And I had it in my hand. No, I had it over here. And walk over there, and one of the girls had the cup out, and she says to me, we don't serve killers. So I says to her, took the combat infantry badge, I says, honey, we don't do this, we weren't doing this because we wanted to do this. But you can take this and jam it up your ass. Now, when my buddy Lynch went back to the hospital, I gave him money, all the money I had. And I keep on badgering him. I said, you never paid me the 40 bucks. But he had enough for his toothpaste and for his, and he was in, uh, he had yellow jaundice, uh, he had whatever it was, they pulled all his teeth out, and he was in the hospital for, I guess, three months or four months. And we finally got together after the war. And we got together at Birch's Garden. Okay, I said he's one of the other people in the picture. Yeah. And uh, so as a consequence, I've never been, uh, and every time I see something that annoys me with the Red Cross, it just, it just inflames me. I can imagine. My goodness. And I, every experience I ever had with the, uh, let's say, the Salvation Army, which was m minimal, was good. I mean, never overseas, I never had the opportunity, but in the States, I knew I always, Never missed a kettle, never missed, I mean, that's fine. I had no problem, other charities, and, and my, my wife, and well, when I came home from service, and they were still passing the bucket around for the Red Cross, you know, and they showed the thing on the, on the, on the, on the movie screen with the Red Cross uh, ambulance, and I'm saying to myself, you know, this is government property, this doesn't belong to the Red Cross, and they passed the bucket around, and, I, and I'm, very, fairly generous. I always give to whatever the cause is. I, and I've worked for causes. I never put in a quarter. I, say, I think I may be wrong in certain areas, but I can't, I can't reject that from my personal being because I knew how much that cup of coffee uh, meant to me and how, how it upset me by having those words said to me. Yeah. The wrong thing to do. Anyways, uh, so not having any dates in order. The other couple of things I'll tell you about. Uh, uh, it was March 4th. Now, this is the day that Paul Fussell got wounded on. Okay? Because it was documented in something I saw on television with Paul Brokaw. This is the university uh, yeah. historian and professor. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I've never contacted him. He was in the same battalion. I don't know what the hell it was. Who the hell I know? I, I had a couple of cowards. I get the, okay, heroic things that I was witness to. At one time, we were the furthest east of anybody in France. We were in a little town called Weisenberg. And if you look at the map, that's right across the river into Germany. Now, we were there and we were getting killed. I was in a basement with, uh, I don't know who else was there with me, some other guys, and this Lieutenant Boyle, who was standing outside the basement, or enough exposed more than, I was, frankly, I think I was crapping on my pants half the time. I was there, I did what I was supposed to do. But I was, I mean, I was functioning out of fear, but not of uh, rational or uh, whatever. And uh, I was the wireman at that time for my mortar squad. And I guess uh, the line was cut. It was severed by an artillery shell or a mortar shell or whatever. I don't know. But uh, the FO from the artillery could communicate 
with the mortar squad because their radio thing was working. So this uh, non-commissioned officer that we had, uh, he wanted me to go out and mend the wire. And uh, I said, you know, I said, I know that's my job. I'm not doing it because I can talk to you. And the FO was the same. We both give the same instructions. So there's no need for me to go out to mend the wire. He says, you go out, or I'm going to have your ass court-martialed. I says, you know what, I'll go out, but I'll make a deal with you right now. You meet me halfway. Okay? As it subsequently turned out that he and there was a lieutenant and there was a sergeant that held back. You know what held back is? They were cowards. Okay? Uh, I, two of them never knew they were cowards because they were drunk. And the day they got into combat, till the last time I saw them, were, wherever it was. So uh, that was it. Anyway, we get to this where I suppose this General McAuliffe was, was March 14th, I think, or, and he's standing about that far away from me and he's got the maps and all that crap. All of a sudden, we get relieved going offline that day. They take us back into a safe area, and we knew something was wrong. They gave us a chicken dinner, you know, with our misfits and all that stuff. Uh, all we can eat, we had jello, we had fruit cocktail, we got paid. Now, this is really crazy because we were laughing. Where are we going to spend the money? So we got paid. And, I know I, and then I understood that we had a big crap game after we got paid. Okay? So the guys were playing craps. It didn't make any difference to me. I didn't have, I, why should I get involved? I wasn't going to win. I wasn't going to lose. That was my concern. We got done with that, and all of a sudden they started to call us company by company, I think, into the school building. I can almost, I can't, re t it, it, not really verbatim, but it went something like this. The 6th Corps chose the 7th Army, chose the 103rd Division, chose the 410th Regiment, chose the 1st Battalion, and this is what we will have behind us. And he started telling us how many divisions on tanks of infantry, how many airplanes, which the first time in, uh, after D-Day, anyway, in direct support of ground infantry, how many extra artillery pieces. There was only one problem. We've got to go first. Well, and we went back to our part in the front line. And then we started to get, you know, we were casualties, you get replacements. And this is still, they don't, until I die, it will always be in my memory. And this one kid, he was a kid, he was the same age I was. He was maybe a year or two younger. And it was his first day in combat. He'd never been in the attack before. And uh, he says, uh, tomorrow's a big attack. I, we knew it was going to be big. And uh, because we were in the middle by, you know, by the Siegfried line, we had to get, get in that crap. And uh, he says, how can, what can you tell me to keep me alive? I said, I can't tell you anything. I can't even tell me how to stay alive. But I will tell you, the only thing I can tell you to do is when we start going through this barrage, okay, keep your eye on me. Don't talk to me. Don't signal me. Just keep your eye on me. If I happen to go, I go. If you happen to go, you go. If anybody else happens to go, they go. But it's going to be whatever it is, we take our chances. But keep your eye on me because I have instincts and things that I've learned and everybody around me that has the uh, survival thing uh, to listen, to know what our instincts are and a little bit of limited knowledge. 
So uh, it was a terrible thing. It was my birthday. Okay. So all night long we hear the tanks rumbling. They're getting up behind us. And they laid down the smoke. And we started going through. And there was one T, whatever it was, radio operator. And he was sitting by a tree. And he was crying. And he wasn't going. I says, no, I, says, I don't want to go either. I says, but if you don't go, he says, I'm going to get killed. I says, I know. But if you don't go, somebody's going to kill you. It isn't a question of choice. And I had to leave. I mean, you know, you do what you have to do. And then one guy came through. He was maybe 50 feet ahead, 200 feet. Ahead, and he was happy. Why? He had gotten what we call was a million-dollar wound. He had a bullet right through the bone. Through the bone, you don't go back. So he was happy. He says, I got a million-dollar wound. I mean, you know what? I was jealous. Wow. You know, things would be jealous over. So anyway, that was part, a little part of that day. Uh, and then somehow or another, I wound up here in a part of that day was a machine gun fight. And I was in a line of fire. I was laying on my stomach. And I, you can tell the difference in the sound because when a bull is looking for you, it's the sound of a whip. Shrapnel, it sounds like a bee. And he was looking at me. Fortunately, uh, I don't know who, I don't know why, I don't know when, but the machine gun nest was out. Got out of there, fire started again. They had to hit the dirt. We were already in German territory. I mean, we were territory we had just chased them out of. And this, I, thought, I guess there's only three people besides you, and I don't ever know what, this is one of the things that still hurts today, and I don't, it's a terrible. I had a weapon. And I was getting under fire. And I went to jump into the nearest foxhole. Okay, you gotta remember, you've got your weapon in your hand, and the safety is off. You've got your figure, finger on the trigger. I leaped into the hole. There was a German soldier in the hole. pulled the trigger, I pulled the head off. I had to lay in the hole for about two hours. Well, that, wasn't a, that wasn't a great experience. I never, my wife knows it, my son knows it. I don't know, I, you know, I think that's, and Lynch knows it, and that's, and you know. But that just, for the record, is some of the things that you put up with. Uh, the fact that Dead bodies were always around. It was, it was part for the course. We had one guy that, uh, for a hobby, his hobby was teeth, gold teeth, where you take the German soldiers and that were dead and rack them up against the wall, take his rifle out, and knock their gold teeth out and put them in a jar. Uh, that was one of the things that uh, I was a spectator of. I can remember one time there was a little town called Schillersdorf in Alsace Lorraine, and through a series of events, Lynch and I got trapped. Well, we had done our, our um, guards' duty. You know, you always provided your own security. And uh, I, it was my turn to, to, to sleep in Lynch's. And all of a sudden, whoever was security, this was, uh, historically, this is the last time that there was any kind of major offensive launched by the SS 
trying to break through going to back to the Severn Pass. I subsequently found out. Well, I was upstairs with Lynch, and I don't know who it was because it was dark. You didn't you heard voices, and he says, "Lynch, Jake, let's get the fuck out of here." And then all of a sudden, the machine gun, I mean, through the windows, and the next words I'll never forget. And I see it on a commercial every once in a while. I mean, words mean different things to different people at different times. And at, when the machine gun first started to come into the, where we were at, the words were, need I say more? Need I say more? The only thing is, is that the, as a subsequently time frame wise, and I have no concept of time, is that they were downstairs, the SS were downstairs, all hopped up on ether and boot, it snapped. And uh, we were trapped upstairs, Lynch and I. So how are we gonna get out? So I've been very resourceful, you have to be. I looked around and you had to make Instant, instantaneous decisions. You didn't, that there, those questions, should or shouldn't they, or, or is this a good move, or is this a good move? And uh, they were coming up the stairs. So we started firing. Had no idea if we were hitting anybody. No idea at all. And I saw out the window. In Alsace Lorraine, you measure a person, a farmer's wealth, by the pile of horse manure they had on the side of the house. So I looked out the window. I said, Dick, this is where we're going. Into the horse shit. He says, Into the horse shit. Got no choices now. I left my gun there. I left my rifle there. He had his. And we ducked out. We landed in a pile of shit. Horseshit. From there, we made it, I guess, I don't know how or whatever, we were absolutely overwhelmed uh, by rifle fire or whatever it was. And we finally escaped. We got into a barn. And it was me and Lynch. I had, the only thing I had was a 45. Because I've got to tell you, everything was free. Any weapon you wanted, American, German, whatever it was, you had as many as you wanted. You didn't clean a gun. You just picked up somebody else's and used it. So uh, we're in this barn, <laughs> and all of a sudden this lid says, here's something. He says, Jake, we prepared to use your piece. But here I got the 45, and I says to him, and what the fuck am I supposed to do, throw it at him? Yeah. So at that time, I made the determination that it was a cow. So I says, come on, I know they're over here, we're trying to get out over there. And he got out the door, and I just had a 45. He had his M1, I think, I'm not positive. And all of a sudden, they're shooting at us. And this SS is screaming, come here, you Yankee son of a bitch. Well, I beat Jesse Owens. I screamed back, hey, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> we took off. Yeah. And we got, uh, we had to retake that town later. That was another thing. I think, I don't know how many guys froze to death trying to take that town. They had a big tiger tank sitting at the, uh, at the um, edge of the forest and just pumping these big rounders. That was another, another episode. And that, uh, the, another episode where, I guess, Malmody had taken place. Remember in Belgium where the, uh, the uh, Nazis had but butchered a hundred and some odd GIs? Well, we were in, in, in where, I don't know, in Alsace. And uh, 
bad news travels fast. And I don't remember who, I don't know, it was my turn to take prisoners back. And I remember somebody said to me, I'll take them back for you. I said, okay, save you a trip, fine. I don't think maybe it was two minutes later, I heard bang, bang, bang. Five minutes later, I don't remember who it was. I said, did you take the prisoners back? And there was no, no answer. So obviously I know what happened. And I wasn't particularly upset over it. I mean, it didn't bother me. What the hell do I care? It's just one, one, just one guy less to worry about. Uh, I assume that you saw Private Ryan? Yeah. Okay. It took me, I don't know, better part of a year to see that movie. Uh, the thing that really uh, made me cry, because it really welled up, is the final scene where they're in a church yard sequence. That was part of my birthday, but in reverse. I can remember uh, they had a sniper up in the uh, church loft, and I was pinned down with, I think, what the hell was his name again? Right. All right, I was pinned down with some other guys, in the, you know, we couldn't move. We were locked in. And, and they sent a couple of fighter planes, because everything was in direct support. It was, and they were shooting artillery, everything was breaking loose, and we couldn't get it. But finally got rid of the sniper. But you'd stick your helmet up, <laughs> hole right through it. And uh, that one kid that I, that on my birthday, that I said, follow me, he stayed alive. So after, I don't know what the, what the sequence was, we went to, I, he says, how did you know what to do. I said, well, I knew by the sound what guns were being, being shot at us at that particular time of, of the departure from our uh, advance point. And I knew what they were 88s, which was, I said, now, I knew by the amount there was a lot of stuff coming at us. Now, I, we had a captured 88 at the time. And I said, now I want you to take a look at this gun. The rules are the same for all weapons of that type. Never fired one. But if you want to search, that means go up and down. All you got to do is turn the crank. So we knew in combat, if a shell landed over here, and a shell landed over there, you were being bracketed in. The next shell was going to be in your back pocket. So all you had to do was turn that crank. This part of a crank would give you 50 feet up, this would give you 50 feet down. But if you were caught in that type of sequence and you went to either flank, they would have to re-level the gun, which took 10 or 15 seconds, depending what the ability of the gunner, okay? So they'd go this way or that way. That was enough time to get out of the direct line of the artillery shell. And enough to keep you open. It just it, it was like like baseball. It was a battle of inches. Yeah. Uh, so, and uh, a lot of other. Uh, it's hard to, to to hit on any days. There's some days there was absolutely nothing doing. Uh, it, it was. I remember we used to wear these shoe packs, uh, where we had regular socks, and then we had the heavy wool socks. And then we had these shoe packs that were a combination of eyelids and these cross things, you know, with the laces. And uh, we would wear out a pair of socks on the heel going up the hill and wear the toes out going down. And if we didn't take care of our feet, uh, as best we could, uh, you had a good chance of winding up with French foot. 
from dents, if you got that, went to the hospital from dents, or if it was real bad, you had amputation. So, uh, uh, then another, well, it was, it was a funny story uh, near the end of the war. Uh, I was carrying mortar ammunition. No idea where the hell I was at. And in addition, whatever we had to carry, there were three rounds of mortar ammunition in the front and three rounds of ammunition in the back. And we had to stop every five minutes, ten minutes. And it was heavy work. I mean, you know, we were tired, it was winter, and we were sweating like horses, and we, we just had to keep on going. And uh, we stopped at one, one point, and I'm walking behind, and you, you couldn't really see anything. And I'm walking behind this member of ours, uh, Christy, that was his name, from, from Queens. And I'm walking behind him, and I tap him on the shoulder, and this is probably close to the dialogue. Christy, yeah, Jake, did you shit in your pants? He says, no. I says, but I smell it. Where is it? He says, it's behind my ears. Yep. Stopped another time to rest, and I turned around and I said, Christy, how did the hell did you ever get shit on the back of your ears? So he said, well, they, you know, when I, the last time or whatever, I took the yoke off because it hurt under the shoulders, and I laid it down. So I laid it down on the pile of crap. On the way over the head, I got it behind my ears. So we were hysterical, we were laughing. I mean, it was funny, you, know, you couldn't do anything about it. So in the, in the midst of everything, you still managed to maintain a certain amount of humor. Yeah. It was mundane humor, it was horrible humor in, in different ways, but it was humor nevertheless. So we got, uh, got into that, I guess the next morning, and I thought we were going into reserve. But we were going into the attack. So sure enough, we get down, and there was a um, group of German soldiers in this uh, in this little forest thing, and we're getting ready. I had, at that time, the key piece I was carrying was a 30 caliber carbine that I had managed to find a saw, and I sawed the stock off because it was lighter. And get ready, take aim, and you know, on the tip of any weapon, you have a little sight thing right in the front. So I said, ah, can't fire, I can't, you know, can't get a beat. So I look like this. Guess what? Shit. That's uh, some of the stuff. It, 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 most of it was a horrendous, horrible experience. The only thing that I have to say in my defense, okay, and there's a lot I haven't told you because I don't remember a lot. Uh, your memory slips by. You remember only the, the, the real low spots which you make into high spots. But the only thing I got to tell you, and I told this to my son one time, he says, you know what? If you want stress, you want real stress, just think about getting out of a hole in the mud and you hadn't eaten a decent meal in a week and having a hand grenade in one lapel, a hand grenade in another lapel, loaded down with as many cartridge belts as you possibly can handle and as many weapons as you think you can be comfortable with and having to get out of a hole under a, under a, sm a smoke screen and go. I said, I'll tell you something. You did it because you had no other option. It was, maybe it was patriotism, maybe it was whatever it was, but it was survival. And uh, I used to, t I told my kids, I said, you know, 
there's only two things that were two things that were ever very they were a mantra. And we kept on repeating them. My, me, the other guys. Number one, better you than me. And the other one is nobody lives forever. And that was it. That's that's. Uh, and then we wound up uh, oh uh, on this task force. And the reason I brought up this Luigi, this guy that was sitting on the tank, we got through with a terrible ordeal one time. There were a lot of casualties, you know, a lot of American casualties. And I don't know how many lives he saved by a very, very simple, simple little thing. I didn't even know what the hell he was doing half the time. He couldn't even speak English, which was a credit to him. After this particular siege, is he held back. And I walked back and I said, what the hell are you doing? And he says, I need medical. You know, he starts screaming for medical, which I heard him scream a lot of times. But I, I was so interested in staying alive, I didn't, yeah. know what, I didn't know what was going on either. Well, what he had done, when a, guy, a GI was hit, he had a very indispensable thing. He had a mirror, a little pocket mirror, and he would put it under his under the, the, the GI's nose. And if he saw moisture, he knew that the soldier was still alive. A simple little thing like that. Yeah. You know how many lives he must have saved yeah. with that little procedure? And I didn't know what the hell he was doing. Yeah. And then the final thing, one of the final things which is very important in my life and a lot of people's other lives, is we were on this task force. And we happened to run into a town named Landsberg in Germany, which wasn't too far away from uh, the town that Albert Einstein was born in. And this town of Landsberg is where Hitler wrote Mein Kampf. Continuing on, there also happened to be a concentration camp that we freed. Jack is telling us about the, his units um, coming to the town of Landsberg, yes. which is significant for several reasons. Yes. Uh, it, was the, it was the place where Hitler was incarcerated at and wrote Mein Kampf. Also, it was the site of a uh, concentration camp that we freed. It was the 103rd Division, but it was primarily the 101st, the 103rd, and the 10th Armored Division, and I don't know who else. You've got to remember, a lot of troops were converging in the same area. We were all on task forces riding on tanks. So these things were out of, not that small. You had these labor camps and concentration camps, and he did, uh, and uh, it was actually, it was a, uh, I wouldn't call it a suburb, but it was about 20 miles or whatever uh, away from Dachau concentration camp, which I subsequently was at. I visited. Now, one of my greatest experiences of my life. You know. <laughs> uh, so anyway, that was uh, we took that, and you got to remember at that time. We knew nothing of a concentration camp. We knew there were concentration camps, but we always assumed they were like detention camps. They were like a labor type of situation. And uh, I was riding on a tank, and with your fellow comrades and whatever, and all of a sudden, a lot of things became a total blur. I saw these people with. Uh, with pajamas on, and they were skeletal, and they were emaciated, and they were filthy. And you didn't know what the identification was. Were they uh, Russian prisoners? Were they Polish prisoners? Were they, who, who were they? All of a sudden, I started to hear Yiddish. I was, holy shit. Ran in there. Uh, I. I'm very muddled, I'm very confused, because there was a lot of things, it was, it's like a symphony of Mahler. There's so many things going on simultaneously, and they're all layered. And you don't know which layer to pull off, or if all these layers will ever get pulled off. But I remember getting very upset. 
I couldn't believe the, the inhumanity that I had witnessed with the corpses. This is, I had seen plenty of corpses before. I mean, but the the, uh, the circumstances were different. Uh, the the magnitude was different. I mean, we saw we get into a into a fight. We'd find uh, twenty dead, thirty dead, whatever the case may be. A couple of pickups on this side, on that side. On March fifteenth, the day of my birthday, was a lot more casualties. It was. It, it, very stressful, and but this is something I still today cannot comprehend. The magnitude of the people, and then the, uh, uh, I guess we were there for a couple of days, because I do remember some sense of, of having the Germans uh, with bulldozers digging these pits for burial. And uh, I have a division book, and it shows one of the pictures of, of one of the heads in the, in the ice tong. Uh, things of that, uh, very, it's horrendous. Uh, so I took a couple of them out of the concentration camp into Landsberg, I assume. And uh, I sp spoke the language. I took the, I, I saw a nice house, walked in there, and the civilians were there, and I had my gun. Nasty, you never went any place without a gun. And I had my, my weapon with me, and I told everybody to get the hell out. All the civilians get the hell out because they're going to kill every fucking one of you. I got them out, and then I went through the house, and I said to these two guys, I said, anything you see is yours, whatever you want. And uh, I guess we spent a couple of days with them because there were a lot of things that I did do. I remember going there, then they needed money, and I went to the, there was a bank. I robbed the bank. And then I got, you know, everything was free. Like I told you, there's a different premise. Everything was free. I remember giving them a German money for Lexmark or whatever it was, and money meant nothing to me because I had no way of spending it. And no way of spending it, sending it home. I had, to, had I wanted to convert or been able to convert, it was no, no, nothing to me, but it would mean something, hopefully, for them. And, uh, oh, I remember one person wanted a watch, and I walked out in the street, and I saw a group of German civilians walking near me, and I said to them in German, can you please tell me the time? But the, you know, and uh, sure enough, the first instinct was to go like this. So I cleaned the mouse. Gave them whatever they want, you know, gave it to these uh, other people. And then I guess we had scrounged for food for them. And, and it, it was just, just horrendous. People were just dying, just, 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 just to, they decided this is when they wanted to die. And the thing uh, that most people don't take into consideration in that situation, and I still in here, smell the smell of decaying bodies, of unclean sanitary conditions. I went a number of years ago with a friend of ours when my wife was went away for a couple of days, and this friend of ours who still friendly with, who's widowed, and I says, come on, I'll take you, we'll go for something. He walked into, I won't mention a franchise, and usually I love every food. For some reason, I walked into that franchise, which is just open the area, and I just turned to her and I says, do you mind if we leave? I never told her why. Took you right back. Yeah, I said, right. would you mind if we leave? As a consequence, it, as a, as a spinoff, for 25 years, I did not go to a 4th of July celebration. I could not, and I still cannot stand fireworks. I go because uh, my children wanted to go, okay? And I would not refuse them. And I went, and I, occasionally, socially, I would go, and the least favorite of all is the, fi the fireworks display. I want to go. I don't want to go. This is bullshit. I've seen the real thing. I said, I don't want to go. To me, this is pain. When I smell gunpowder, it's pain. When I see a rifle, and I said to my son one time, I said, you know, people have to be responsible. People have to know what it is.
to do the most irresponsible or responsible thing in the world. And he said, do you know how much moral effort it takes to raise a rifle or any weapon with the intention to be bodily harmed? That's a big responsibility. I never forgot that responsibility. And there are times that I think in my mind, how many times have I dropped a, in other elements, been at the mortars and dropped the shells into the tube as a first gunner? And saying in my mind, I wonder how many some women and children I killed with this. You don't know. You don't know. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't stay awake dreaming about it or thinking about it, and, uh, but it's never out of your mind. So does World War II end then for you at Lands no, Landsberg? No, Landsberg. We were, we were still on a task force, and then it was a weird situation. We wound up going through, on this task force, through Mittenwald, Garmisch Park, and Kirchen, and over Amagau to place those places geographically. They were in the Alps. There were three towns in Germany. There were ultra, this was going into the best suburb of, of Europe. Garmisch Partenkirchen, this is where Richard Strauss lived, the composer. And he raved to us. I had no idea who it was. He raved to you? Yes. I had no idea who it was until maybe 20 minutes later that somebody said to me, you know who that was? I had not had the faintest idea. I don't know who that old fart was. Okay? He said, you know, that was Richard Strauss. I said, oh. And you, at the time, it wouldn't have meant anything to you, Kurt Yes, because Kurt... I was a music lover, yeah. okay? Yeah. Oh, it would have meant to you at that time. Oh, sure. Yeah. It still means something. What about Kurt Vonnegut? Kurt Vonnegut had no, I, I, don't, I just read about it. That's all. I just knew that, that he was in the 409th and the, there was a couple of episodes that I read in relation to his life, and, and I just, I'd say, yeah, he was in there too, yeah. okay? And then we had other little isolated instances, one guy, Lundin, we were at the one time, and he was a guy that got lost, he was the Jeep driver of his <laughs> company, and he got lost, and he, I could still see him going in the Jeep, he drove in right into the German lines and got captured. He, he lived, I think he's still alive today. So I remember that episode, I said, where the hell is he going? And he got captured. A uh, little isolated things, I went on a patrol one night, and uh, it was uh, a reconnaissance patrol. During the bulge period, uh, there were a lot of things were blurred. And all of a sudden, we, I hear this racket, and my buddies were laying there on the forward edge of this hill, and that comes Tiger tank. It pulls up in front of me, and there were Tiger tanks in back of them. Because our first impulse, we were supposed to be in just a reconnaissance, see what was going on, but our first impulse was when saw this guy, this not this uh, German soldier, get out. The copula opened, and he got out, and he walked out, and the copula was open, and he took a leak. Okay, and. We were trying to figure out, let's go and drop a grenade in there. So this was a stupid thing to do because there were three or four tanks behind him. All he had to do was turn the turns, Goodbye. we're gone. So I guess we got the nudge and we didn't do it and we came back and I don't know what subsequently happened after that because you never knew what the end of some of these stories were. You knew the beginning and sometimes you knew the end and sometimes you only do the middle and sometimes you do ab absolutely nothing. So uh, that's part of the, uh, we got to uh, Garmisch Park in Kirchen, that's where Strauss was, beautiful stuff. And Mittenwald, which was famous for, all famous for their scenery and their, uh, their spas. This is uh, one of the greatest violin making towns in the world, which I, they had a, 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 a blisk over uh, extolling the virtues of violin making. And the other one was Oberammergau. And uh, this is where they uh, had the Passion Play. 
you said passion play. Mm -hmm. was Ten years, yeah. Uh, okay, at, at over on yeah. And I remember all the houses were painted with this. And then I remember going down from the mountains into the plains of Innsbruck, which was not The scene was, we cut, and then, then part of the outfit cut them off. Uh, I guess we met at the Brenner Pass, where Hitler had met Mussolini. And uh, then we got the orders, I guess, uh, that, uh, what the hell is this guy's name? Uh, Admiral somebody uh, assumed control of, uh, of um, Germany, Germany no, and Germany or somebody? Yeah, so yeah. some admiral. And, yeah. uh, and uh, then it was crazy. We walked up, we, there was a surrender, we walked up to the German, uh, German soldiers, just handed us the weapons. Then the quest for food came up again. So then we got a jeep. <laughs> had a 30 caliber machine gun. <laughs> and we were in Innsbruck, and I don't know where the hell we went. We had food, man. We did it just like they do on television. We were gangbusters. We walked in there, and we went down the basement, and we had food. Uh, some of the other things that, uh, that happened were uh, very remarkable. Uh, it was, if you lived through it, it was the best experience of your life as harrowing as it is, because you had experiences you knew that you were never going to, if you lived through them, you were never going to have again, hopefully. And the thing that I get very upset with is the fact that throughout the other intervening uh, conflicts in the world, and I, I always felt that, you know, if you took these politicians and these, irrespective of a religion or whatever it is, and some of these religious leaders, put them and let them fight it out. Let them fight it out. Put them behind a gun. Let them know what it is to, 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 to sit behind a machine gun. Let them know how to, how not to eat and not, and, and this is a little antidote. Did you know how you took a, take a crap when you're going on a, are you in transit and, the, and going from one part of the front line to another? You know how you do it? In the winter time? You drop the guy's pants and you put them over the tailgate. Two guys hold one leg, two guys hold the other, two guys hold the arm, two guys hold the other, and let it go. These are just little functioning things that you have to do. I mean, you have, if you want to, you can do them in your pants, too. I've done that, been there, done that. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a living, or I used to say it's a living almost to the point of being a dying. And then you say, the, um So you, so the war ends in Europe, um, 45, and you're still in the army until 40, 46? 46. And are you in Europe during that We're time? in Europe being trained to go to Japan. Right, you got a few months there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. During that period of time after the war, we were in a town near Germany, in Germany, after Innsbruck, we got, I don't remember which outfit, I, we, we were getting an upgrade from a line company. We were going to a new thing called 4.2 chemical mortars. It wasn't the greatest deal either, but it was better <laughs> than where we were at. So we started to get training on that, and then all of a sudden they, they had the atomic bomb thing, and, and then we started counting points to go home. But in the intervening time, we got involved in a little town called St. Jorgen, which is outside of Munich. Now, this was a... Um, German installation where they had chemical weapons. I don't mean one weapon. I was underground there. This is part of what we did. There were thousands and thousands and thousands of chemical uh, missiles or artillery missiles or whatever. Uh, German. German. Huh? German. German. It was so important to the Germans, they had, they had their own fighter planes protecting it. In fact, I have a picture someplace, I don't know where it's at, of me sitting on top of a fighter plane. It was, it was, you know, was, was non-operational, but just the fact that I wanted that picture to, 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 to make sure that, that this wasn't uh, a fantasy, this was reality. So those were weapons the Germans were hoping to use, and uh -huh. did use some? Now, or? other points of history, it, it, from my knowledge, on the way back and from inspecting the site, this is where George Patton smashed up and got killed. Okay? 
I may not, I'm not positive, but this is what I think. I think Eisenhower was there. I don't know, a lot of big people were there because this was big time stuff. And uh, let's see. Uh, you made a comment that you that the Germans weren't out, thought they were outmassed. Did you say something like right. that? That's right. They were superb fighters. And I mean that in every sense. Uh, I've been under their machine gun fire. I've been in their machine gun duels. Their weapons were far superior than what we had. Their supply lines were shorter than what we had. Their machine gun had a rate of fire that was, I think, at least twice as fast as our old World War II machine guns, because that's what they were. The M1, was their was our primary uh, weapon, and it was good. The BIR was good. The Germans' weapons were better. They had a Schmeisser, I don't remember the year or whatever, uh, there, which was which was a fabulous weapon. Uh, their, um, their that was machine guns. Uh, their their pistols were the uh, P38s and the uh, the Lugers. They were awesome, absolutely awesome. Their artillery, that 88, they could drop that 88 shell right in your back pocket. Also, they had very esoteric uh, uh, armaments. I remember being fired on uh, by a railroad gun. I think it was 280 millimeters. I think the name of the gun was called Alsace Annie as referring to the uh, parallel of Big Bertha. Bertha. That's right, yeah. 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 And when that thing went off, you knew. I mean, you were, it's, the, the 88 sounded like a pea shooter compared to that. Yeah. There weren't very many, many rounds that were fired, but I remember each and every one of them, because yeah. I know I was really hurting. Then there was one episode that I saved a person's life not heroically, but we were digging a foxhole, and this person next to me, Cummings, I think was his name, and he was starting to crack. And every time he heard a sound, he hit the dirt, and I'm trying to dig a foxhole. So finally, I was getting kind of, you know, every time he, he hit the dirt, I hit the dirt. I figured maybe he knows something I don't know. I don't take any chances. So after a couple hours of that, I was getting a nerve. So my company commander happened to pass by his, uh, Captain Lincoln and got out of the jeep and I motioned for him, you know, took him on the side and I said, what's the matter? And I says, you know what? Just Cummings out of here because you can get us all killed. He said, what do you mean? I says, I'm going to go back there and start digging. Digging in, I told him what happened. You just watch. We get the message in less than a minute, and sure enough, I got back. Uh, I wasn't any more than 50 feet away from this uh, commander of mine, and sure enough, every time, bingo, hit the dirt, hit the dirt. Five seconds later, bingo, hit the dirt. I hit the dirt, and so did everybody else around. We all, you know, we all sensed that something was uh, was not right. Pulled him offline. Saved his life. Hopefully saved ours too. It's crazy, crazy things that uh, you don't... Uh, y y there are things that are still unreal because they are unreal. It's not a real world. And I, I used to... And I always... They, they, they say these, these criminal things and I say, you know something? A combat is free. Everything is free. You can harm, maim, kill, destroy, burn, pillage, loot, rape, any, all of the above, none of the above, depending on your ability, your position, and uh, your, uh, and your desire, and nobody gets punished for it. Yeah. Except yourself. You have to live with it, I suppose. Yeah, you gotta live with all, you gotta live with all your consequences, you, things that you do on a whim, for entertainment, for unbelievable. I love music. I didn't hear music for a long time, and I happened to get into a situation 
where I was in the company of somebody that had a piano, this woman. And I don't know, you, did you see the movie The Pianist? No. Well, this, this was really happened to me before it happened to them. And I, was, I saw that piano and I saw that woman. And I saw that piece of music, and I still remember the name of that piece of music. It was the revolutionary etude of Chopin. And I said to her in German that I would like to hear some music being played. And she says that she can't. And I took up my 45 and I pointed her ahead. You just learned how. And did she play? She played. There was another episode where we were at this very, very nice place and they had this fire. Uh, firewood, uh, where they kept their firewood, firewood bin or whatever, because they did an awful lot of cooking in there. So no matter how fancy the house was, and this place was really nice. <coughs> and we were going to make dinner. We found a couple of chickens or whatever it was, and we were going to make a good dinner. We didn't have wood. So they said, Jake, go, we'll go shoot off the lock and we'll take the wood. I said, no, leave, the, leave, leave it alone. Just leave the, leave, the, leave the lock the way it is. I got a better idea. So we know, know what we use for wood? For furniture. Have no qualms at all. Some of the little things that you did for entertainment. You have to have something going yeah. for you. It wasn't, I mean, right now, uh, for the last 60 years, I mean, if somebody dropped a million dollars in my lap, I don't, I don't think I would touch it, okay? But there's things that I did that I, I'm, not, I'm not particularly proud of. But it's just that things happen, and you, it's on whim because it was a change of pace. It was a, a sort of uh, release. You know, was, well, how did you handle the transition from being out of the Army, from going, returning to civilian life? Did it take I, a while? Was it I'm harsh? still do, going through it. Wow. I'm still going through it. You never, you never finish with the cathartic thing of doing this. There are certain things, there are certain phrases, certain things that'll happen. I didn't go to a war movie. I stayed away. Fourth of July, I stayed away. I went to a movie. I didn't walk out of the house. Okay? Uh, my wife understood. She accepted it. When my children got to the age where they wanted to go to a Fourth of July parade, well, you had to go to a Fourth of July parade. But I wasn't happy about it. And when I saw it, I mean, I wasn't, you know, even when I'd go to a concert and they had the 1812 overture and they fired the cannons, I was getting anxious already. Yeah. Okay? Did you make use of the GI Bill then when you got Yes, home? when I got home, uh, I started to go to college. Uh, and uh, I was dating this, well, anyways, I started to go to college and I did my first semester, and I was in the middle of my second semester. Uh, like I said before, my mother and dad were very poor, but they were, my father, they were very intelligent, but they just didn't have the uh, social graces, and they didn't have the education. And uh, although in my dad's case, he learned how to speak four different languages and do it well, and read and write and be functional all of them, because he had nothing better to do. He didn't have employment. So he self-educated himself uh, for the most part. Well, anyways, I had, at the time, two older brothers that were in the produce business. Uh, the one, one of the owners of my brother uh, was married and had two children. I was in the middle of the second, uh, the second semester of my first year, and I came home from school one day, and my mother says, uh, uh, my brother, is in a hospital, he's going to have surgery, and he, you have to support his family. So, according to our tradition at the time, and uh, I said, uh, okay, and I just walked away from school, and uh, assuming that uh, when my brother recovered, that we, all three of us would go into a different endeavor. It didn't work out that way because after this brother got well and got back to business and all of a sudden after two or three weeks, uh, he said to me, you're going to have to go find a job because uh, it doesn't carry for two families. I know it's kind of can carry for three. So that meant 
and all this. It's that I was out of school, mm -hmm. I was out of work, mm -hmm. and I was out of uh, out of touch. Mm -hmm. It's called fend for yourself. Uh, in retrospect, I never should have quit in school because of, of, of uh, they would have made it somehow. But being uh, uh, very soft, and at that time, I was just so happy to be alive that I figured, well, I'll, 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 I'll make do and, and whatever. But prior to that, when I was going to high school, I got a, I got a part-time job as a messenger boy for a watchmaking place where they repaired timepieces uh, downtown, and I was the messenger boy to get the parts and this and that and the other thing. And uh, I was fast. There, was, there weren't too many messages. It was the person I made $4 a week. And so I would play with the timepieces, and I loved them. So uh, I saw a sign in the streetcar that said, be independent, be a watchmaker. I'm covered under the GI Bill, gave the income, I enrolled, I passed the aptitude test, I did okay. In the meantime, I, I met this girl who subsequently became my wife, and she worked for a jeweler. I got in the, no, no, it wasn't that. I worked for a, um, uh, for a um, uh, watch company it was at the bottom. But uh, her father, her boss needed somebody to sell part-time for Christmas. And I had never, I sold it, uh, you know, I could bullshit a little bit. So uh, I, I went to work during the Christmas season, and I started selling. So all of a sudden, I, when I was working at this other place, the man to, who became my boss walked in the office and said, I'm firing Ming me, I'm hiring him. So I went to work with my father in the same place. So I could sell, I learned how to repair, I became, uh, a lot of bad things happened there, they were getting older, it got to the point where I was sustaining the entire business because I was the only one that was functional. So, and the son of the owner, who was an attorney, uh, quite successfully, and he had, he, he said, he said, you know, when I finally did get control of the business, and one of thing was happening, uh, bookkeeping wise, the business was going bankrupt. Number two, I had carried those on my back for 15 years. I was working nights, moonlighting, doing work for other stores in order to justify our total existence. So uh, anyways, I finally, uh, I did, uh, I got control of the business and for, for the power of desire to succeed as I turned the bankrupt business into a successful business. Uh, I don't want to tell you how many times I got stuck up how many times I got to this or the other thing, but uh, eventually I got out. After 13 years of owning it, I got out, and I was 60 and a half, and I retired. I sold the business, and I retired. I didn't want to. I said, you know something? I, I got lucky. I worked hard. I saved. I didn't piss it away. I uh, didn't make any big investments, but I secured my little condo in Morton Grove. I secured a little condo. Ten years ago in Florida, and I paid for that, and everything was fine. I got enough to eat. I can drive a car. I can go to a show, and uh, I educated uh, the two children that I do have uh, from nothing. My daughter is has a master's in psychiatric social work. Lives out in Massachusetts. Her husband graduated from Williams in Columbia, my baby capital. Okay? Uh, so those are nice achievements in addition to the medals. Right. Huh? <clears throat> Two grandchildren there, a boy and a girl, wonderful kids, scholastically, socially wonderful. They, I can't laud enough praise on them that is done by other people. Right. I'm not talking about me, I'm talking about other people. Right. Both kids are presidents of their classes, okay? Both uh, fantastic grades. There are, he plays the drums also in the marching band. My granddaughter plays the flute. She's in the marching band. Uh, 
whatever the, the, the thing is, they, you don't have to tell them to do the homework. They do. They know how to study. They know how to work. They know how to achieve. And my grandson, he got a job two years in a row at a very nice restaurant. He's a busboy. He knows how to work physically. And he makes his own money. He buys his own stuff. And he's indispensable to the business now because he learned how to wait. He learned how to cook. And one of the pluses, the, the people that owned the restaurant were at one time, they were providers of foods for places like the Rolling Stones and things of that nature. So they come well documented there. Here in Chicago, my son, who I'm, very, I'm proud of, all of them, uh, he's 50, 55, no, 56. He went to University of Michigan, okay, scholarship, and with the scholarship it cost mega bucks, okay, which is fine. Uh, spent eight years there, doctor. Whoa, what's his field? Internal medicine, okay. Two daughters, oldest daughter just became a CPA, lives in New York, uh, was sought out by uh, I, I forgot the name of the firm, one of the biggies. Beautiful girl, very talented, lives in New York. The other one also graduated from Michigan with honors. My son is a Phi Beta Kappa. Wow. Okay. My son is an AOA, which in medical school is the same as Phi Beta Kappa in medical school. Okay. And uh, I, can, I don't brag, I don't really say much of anything. But uh, the other granddaughter is starting her junior year at the University of Michigan. Boy, you're a big blue family. Well, what can I tell you? Yeah. Also, uh, my son in his practice right now has 11 physicians. Just as uh, he was for six years uh, as a side issue. He was a doctor for the Chicago Bulls. Oh. You know, remember Michael Jordan? Yeah, yeah. And, okay, all these guys. And then there was that they had that um, orthopedic Heffernan was there at that time. He controlled all of it. Yeah, and I went to Heffernan for, a, for an athletic injury. Yeah. Wow. He controlled every part of the, for six years, the entire medical structure for the Bulls. You know, Mr. Weinberg, I think this had to be another great conversation. <laughs> another great conversation. Okay. But, I said uh, we're ending it. Yeah, I, I, okay. I, I, I reached a. Uh, We're on overload. Yeah. But I, I don't, I, I was, I don't, uh, I don't, I don't brag. No, per se. no. But, uh, but the, uh, the quote from uh, Carolyn Kennedy is what I'm, I'm yeah. hearing as you're saying this. You know, so. Uh, but I suppose the wartime experience and uh, surviving. Well, I and, think, uh, you know something. And the it was, and, uh, it's. I'm. I'm not a religious person, by any stretch of imagination. After what I saw. Yeah. Okay. I. And my father knew it when I came home. I told my mother and my dad. I said, I know you were raised Orthodox. I know where you come from. I know what I saw. I know what I witnesses. I said, you know something. The only thing I got to say about God is someday you're going to have a big convention of all the gods. But the real God can't find a place. He got okay. I said the real God can't find a parking place. So after that, he knew. He never contested. He never. He knew. I just don't go. I go. Uh, when the children were small, I gave them all the education, all the things that they required, and let them make their choices. I still never question the choices of my children, my grandchildren, whatever the religious factors were. This was fine. I went along with everything, and uh, fine. I mean, I, I, whatever the decision is, uh, they're good, decent, intelligent, and very uh, praiseworthy people. And uh, what else can I tell you? Thank you, Mr. Weinberg. I didn't die. And you didn't die. Thank God. See? <laughs> oh. <laughs>